Luke 19. Oh, you didn't have it on. 41 through 44 this morning. Now, I'll share with you again that when we first started this four years ago, we did a lot of messages had to do with nature and the scriptures and encouraged people. Then back in January 2016, the Lord laid on my heart because as a pastor, I'd always preach expository preaching through the book of the books of the Bible or different subject matters, and we'd try to focus on that. And the Lord gave me a burden that in our world today, we've got a lot of preachers even preaching a lot of stuff. But I've got a burden that we need to go back and really focus on the words of Jesus. So we began back in January 2016 with a chronological Bible and started where Jesus, when he first started speaking at the age of 12. And we've been going through his life. And now we're, this is actually message 98. And we've probably got another 30 to go, at least, as I look at things down the road. And, uh, and you'll see, as we've come to this part in his life, now, I'm just taking bit by bit. Roger and Cheryl's been with us for uh, the last three weeks, and I appreciate that they're host also here at the park, as we are. And so there's some repeating going on that I'm going to share at the beginning, because the, to me, the Bible is exciting. But a lot of people say, I can't read the Bible. It's just so hard to read and hard to understand. Well, it's just like uh, you say, it's like eating an elephant, you know. You just got to do it one bite at a time. And that's what we're taking as little bites at a time into the words that Jesus is saying and allowing those words to speak to us, whether we like those words or not. We're going to let those words speak to us because of what we do as disciples of Christ. We let him direct us and guide us. So the last few weeks we have been with Jesus as he enters the last week of his life before his crucifixion. The time is the Passover which was a feast when the Jews would bring their sacrificial lambs to Jerusalem. So by, they are cramming in to the city streets of Jerusalem, bringing their sacrificial lambs with them. And Jesus is coming on this occasion, bringing himself, the Lamb of God, who will take away the sins of the world. Now, Josephus, who was a Jewish historian, actually estimated that there was between two and three million people packed into Jerusalem at that particular time. So Jerusalem is not a small town. Even then, it's a large place and people are gathered in. And Jesus has lived his entire life that he might fulfill all the prophets foretold of the Messiah, our Savior, that was coming. That he... As our, Messiah, as our Savior, as the Messiah, would, could come and take away the sins of the world. And again, I share with you the verse just before this we've really spent the last three weeks, a couple of weeks looking at. In Zechariah 9 and 9, one of them is, Behold your king cometh riding on a donkey. Uh, now the Bible tells us in this place where he is at, it's near Jerusalem on the Mount of Olives. And on this mountain, a lot of things, Jesus loved this mountain, apparently. Jesus will tell us from this mountain, or he'll tell his disciples about his second coming. On this mountain, at the foot of the mountain, actually, Jesus will pray until his perspiration will become as great drops of blood. And on this mountain, Jesus will, after rising from the dead, spending 40 days ministering to his disciples, he will actually ascend back into heaven from this place and so from this point where he is today this mountain he is beginning to descend into the city of Jerusalem for his triumphant entry and it began as we shared a couple weeks ago with him sending his disciples to go to a nearby village and to just see a donkey tied and get that donkey and bring it and be, and he they would be blessed by the owner. They would be as they carry the donkey. But as they bring him back to Jesus, they we are told that they take their clothes. They lay it across the donkey. They make a saddle for him to ride on. And Jesus began to ride on this wild beast that had never been rode before. And at that point, the people that were gathered around were amazed. And they began to... Uh, laying their coats on the ground and their branches on the ground and they began to walk and they began to shout and, and praise the Lord as they were singing Hosanna to the son of David Hosanna blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord Bl Hosanna to the highest and we are told 
that the religious leaders of that time, the Pharisees, began to ask Jesus to rebuke his disciples and his followers, and that he shared with them, and he proclaimed, I tell you that if, there should, if they should keep silent, the stones would immediately cry out. At this, his triumphant entry begins, and that's where we were last week. But as his triumphant entry begins, he stops the procession and he looks over to Jerusalem from the top of the mountain. In Luke 19, 41, if you'll read with us, it says, Now as he drew near, he saw the city and he wept over it, saying, If you had known, even you, especially in this your day, the things that make for your peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. For days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment around you, surround you and close you in on every side and level you and your children within you to the ground. And they will not leave you one stone upon another because you did not know the time of your visitation. So we see here as he come and he begins this procession. He comes to a point that he looks into the city and he begins to weep over it. Now, there's two times that Jesus is shared with us that Jesus wept while he was here on the earth. That we're given these two times. The first was at the, t at the grave of Lazarus in John 11:35. Jesus wept. And it also it says he groaned in his spirit. These were tears for a friend. You see, these are significant to us because he had friendships. He, he loves us all. But as he established personal friendships, as we should, it's all right for us to weep. It's all right for us to care. It's all right for us to love one another. We need, the Bible says we are to love one another and to love our neighbor. And then the second time he wept is very significant also. It's this time we were reading about. It was a love for his country, which we know today as patriotism. He loved Jerusalem. He loved the Jewish people. They were the chosen. But he comes and he weeps over because he sees their future because of the rejection of him. And people, we as Christians, we need today to look at America and we need to be broken hearted as we pray for our country as we take stands we need to take I mean uh, we are killing our own children we're killing our own ones that will come behind us that could carry this torch our country is killing them and now our country has accepted marriage that God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah over. We have turned from God as Jerusalem and Israel had. We have turned from God and we who know the scriptures and know the Lord, yes, we need to rejoice in who God is and we know the victory that we won the war, but we need to be burdened for our country and our people and this world and the lost in it. We need to have a broken heart today. Did you know that Jerusalem, the word or the name Jerusalem means city of peace? City of peace. But as Jesus wept over it that day, he wept over it because of their rejection of their Messiah. He'd come. And it's a city that has never known peace. Never. What Jesus shared would take place actually took place in the year 70 AD. 30 years after Jesus said these words, the Roman general by the name of Titus under the command of Caesar, Caesar, Caesar command, told him to go and destroy the city of Jerusalem and, and Titus led his army and they built walls around the city they dug pits, as the scripture says, built walls, dug pits, as Jesus said what happened. They built towers around the city. All in 10 days, they did this. That they 
Nobody could come in and nobody could go out of the city, thus creating a great famine within the city. Then they seized the city, destroying everything except a few towers because they were so beautiful. Just a few towers. But Jesus had said in verse 44, And level you and your children within you to the ground, and there will not leave one stone upon another. We're told that Titus took a plow and plowed the ground where the temple was. That's pretty level. Jesus said he would, they would level the ground of this city. This great city was leveled. Jesus being God in the flesh loved Jerusalem and he weeps over it because of the destruction he knows is coming to them. He's given them opportunity after opportunity to have peace as their name says. Yet they have forsaken him. You see, because only a holy God cannot allow unholiness to stand. Yet in his love, he wept. He had delivered them, their forefathers, from Egypt's bondage because of their rejection of him. He had blessed them. And we know if you study the Old Testament, if you study history, time and time again, the Lord would bless Israel. And then they would turn against him and they would sin as God has blessed America, then turn against him. And then they would repent. God said it's when his people turn from their wickedness and repent, he will heal the land. And they would repent and he would again bless. But then again, generations would come. Over and over, God gave them opportunities. They had eyes to see, but they could not see. In Luke 7, 16, it says, After Jesus had raised a widow's son from the dead, the people in the village of Nain were seized with fear, and they glorified God, saying, A prophet has risen among us, and God has visited his people. So there's evidence that they saw and they even recognized, but they didn't see that God is visiting them in his son. Jesus also cried out uh, in a loud voice in Luke 13, 34. He said, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, killing the prophets and stoning those who are sent to you. How often would I have gathered you together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings? But you would not. He has compassion. He's a loving God. But again, a holy God must stand for holiness and cannot allow wickedness and evilness to continue. They could have had peace, though. They could have had peace. They're the, that's their name, the city of peace. Luke 17, 20 says, being asked by the prophets when the kingdom of God was coming, he answered them. Jesus said, the kingdom of God is not coming with signs to be observed, nor will they say, lo, here it is. There, or there, for behold, the kingdom of God is in the midst of you. He told them who he was time and time again. But again, they had eyes, but they could not see. They would not receive. Jesus went a long way and out of his way to clarify that the current expectations that these people had at that time of a political warrior, the Messiah they were looking for, was misguided. It's not what the scripture said would happen. They, it was man-made. There's so many things even uh, in our world and in our churches. We make them. And they're traditions, but they're not of God. That's why we want to come back to the scriptures. So back to what Jesus is saying to us. You see... The king and his kingdom, he was trying to show them, tell them, has already arrived. And it, it was manifest in the power of Jesus' words and his deeds while I was here. Now, you know history, yes, on May 14, 1948, Israel became a nation again, which was also prophesied, would take place. And the city of Jerusalem was rebuilt. But yet, it has never been a city of peace. 
It has never been a city of peace. And it will not be a city of peace until Christ sits on the throne of David. Now, what's all that got to do with us here today, you and me? What's all this that we're talking about, the past and the future, got to do with us? Well, actually, a whole lot. A whole lot about things that are yet to come and come to pass according to the Scriptures. And guess what? The Scripture said it. It's going to happen. The Scripture has never failed. It has never lied. It is the truth. There is no truth except the Scriptures. It is the absolute truth, brother. But really, I don't have time, and you probably don't have time this morning for us to go into all of that. So what I, I want to give you a little taste of that. But I want to come here with us today this thought with you. Jerusalem's a city of peace, but it's never had peace. J Jesus came, gave his life. He was, his body was just tore apart. It was not recognizable as a man as he hung upon a cross. He died there for our sins so that you and I could know peace. That peace. Real peace. John 14, 27 says, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. Not as the world do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. He says in John 16, 24, Unto now you have asked nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive that joy, that your joy may be full. All right, when you've got peace, you've got joy. Praise the Lord. And John 15, 9, he says, As the Father loved me, I also have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may remain in you, and that your joy may be full. So Jesus today even desires for you as he desired and wept over Jerusalem to have peace. He weeps over and he desires for you and I who was created in his image to have peace, to have joy, real joy, his joy, his love. He desires for you to have that. As Jesus looks down today, I just want to ask you, do you think as he looks down, does he weep when he sees this world? Does he weep when he sees America in the condition that we are in? The turning against each other and so much. Does he look at Panama City and Panama City and maybe where you're watching today? Does he weep when he sees you and knows that maybe you don't have that peace, that joy that he desires for you to have? because you've rejected him in the past. And he's given you one more opportunity today to have that peace and to have that joy and to know him. Because he desires for you to know true peace, joy, and love. He desires for you to have that. He, he desires for you to repent of your sins, turn from your wickedness, and allow Him to be your Lord, your Savior. He does the saving. We don't do it. But we just have to receive what He has for us. If you don't have that relationship today, if you didn't wake up this morning praising Him and thanking Him for the love and the peace, even though in this troubled world that you have, I want to invite you. We're going to pray in just a little bit. And if you're here, we're going to invite you to just stay with us. We'll be around today and right after here and we'd love to pray with you and share with you how you can have that joy and peace and those that are watching on the internet there's uh, places there where it tells you how to get in touch with us through email through texting through the phone we would love to share with you and let you know that you can have this peace and introduce you to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Also, if you're a believer and you did wake up this morning praising the Lord for all that He is and what He means to you and you're seeing Him work in your life today, uh, I love to hear those stories too. I love to rejoice for my brothers and sisters in Christ. We need to share with one another what God is doing. So if after we pray, but I want to give you an opportunity to know what the Scripture says about as we come to this point in our life, that He wants you to have that peace. 
In Romans 5, 12, he says, Therefore, just as through one man sin entered into the world, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men, because we're all sinners, people. We're all sinners. You can be a preacher's kid, or piano player's kid, or raised in America, but you're still a sinner until you come to receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. Romans 6.23 says the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through the Lord Jesus Christ. And what's so amazing in Romans 5.8 it says, but God demonstrated his own love toward us that while we were sinners, while we were his enemies, Christ died for us. How do you get that gift? How do you receive that gift of eternal life? Romans 10.9 says that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture says, whosoever believes on him will not be put to shame, for whosoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Again, we want you to share with somebody, if God has spoke to you, because you need to come to, first to him, but you need others in your life that are disciples of Christ to be a part of life, to be mentors, uh, that you can grow. You need a church. You need a church body that you can come together and encourage one another and worship together and go out and share with others. As we close today, I want to just leave this word with you again. Live today as if Christ died yesterday. He rose this morning. Live like he rose this morning and he's coming back tomorrow. It'll make a difference in your life. Father, we love you, and we thank you, Lord, for loving us. We thank you again for this privilege to be obedient to that call you played upon, placed upon our heart and our the burden. And we thank you for these that have been helped us to be obedient today by coming and encouraging us by being here. And those that would tune in through the different mediums, through the Internet, Lord, we just thank you for these means to reach out. And it's amazing how you use your little servant. And we just pray that days will, many today will come and they will know your peace. They will know your joy. They will experience true love by knowing your love. And we pray that you will be glorified. For it's in the holy name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen.